Hello, and welcome to Unlock the Door Radio. This is your host, Michael Cross, and for the next hour, we're going to be discussing uh, psychology and basically the psychology of the mind, marketing, and so if we're going to deal with this particular issue, I think it's appropriate that we deal with an individual that many of you have never heard of. Well, at least if you just rely on what you might run across in um, American – uh, high school uh, history books and courses and so forth. Uh, you hear about this name in alternative media, but this individual that I'm going to be talking about tonight has had a major – well, I would say actually so great an influence on the 20th and now the 21st centuries that we could actually call him the father of the 20th and 21st centuries. And that particular individual's name is none other than Edward Bernays. Now, some of you that might tune in to uh, alternative media or who have degrees in psychology or have worked with marketing on an advanced level, you may have run into Bernays. Uh, but most people out there do not even know who this guy is. And those that may have heard his name have maybe heard him a little bit on alternative media where his name's associated with modern day marketing, uh, but not really known uh, not really known a great deal about this individual. But I think in order to really understand the American, well, or even the Western mind, and maybe in the next few years, the entire world's mind, we need to understand exactly the uh, the uh, theories that Edward Bernays promoted, although they weren't really his theories. They were more like his uncle's theories, uh, Sigmund Freud, the uh, great psychologist. Um, but we really need to find out the cornerstone of his theories in order to understand the mind today. And this extends not just in who's trying to sell you a bar of soap or a car or a line of makeup or uh, trying to get you to listen to, I don't know, um, the modern music like uh, you know Justin Bieber or One Direction or any of these kinds of things we see in the media a lot. It extends also to politics. And it extends into any area where we try to persuade people to – either part with their money or change their values or change their ideas. And so to really understand which direction – well, where we used to be, where, we're, where we've gone, and where we're going, we really, really under, need to understand a little bit more about this individual. And then we have a better idea of, well, the techniques that are still used – every day, everywhere we look to get us to change uh, our direction in which – you know what we're doing or to get us to adopt new ways of thinking or basically just to part with our hard-earned money. So let's go ahead and begin and analyze this individual so that the next time you hear a fleeting comment about, well, Edward Bernays and, and you know some of these other people um, – You'll understand exactly what the person's talking about and maybe even understand uh, the science of manipulation and be able to better counter it or be in a better position to influence other people yourself to get them to uh, think in new and different ways. Now, essentially, Edward Bernays, uh, I mean he was born in 1891. OK, so uh, I know there's this there's this uh, prejudice in um, I know it's in academia, but it's also out in the in the general public's mood that anything that's old is basically useless. You don't deal with the old stuff. You just deal with the new stuff. The problem is, I mean, we don't revamp the theory. Uh, I mean, we can't go there. The law of gravity because the ideas were promoted uh, or put forth hundreds of years ago. 
uh, we don't change things that are actually correct. Now, the thing is, you might have people that might add to these uh, theories or laws. They may uh, question certain aspects of them, but still the foundation remains. And when it comes to Bernays, I don't think there's been really that much that's been done except to refine the techniques of manipulation so that you can better reach people. And the technology we have back in his day, you had radio, newspaper. Uh, today we have everything. We have iPhones. We have um, computers, the internet. Uh, we have, again, we have television, which many people get their information from television, which, um, well, I won't comment on that right now. And, you know, movies, movies uh, contain a propaganda message. Um, oh, by the way, you know, we use the word propaganda. Bernays uh, did not shy away from the word because originally in his day, propaganda just meant you change people's opinions on something. <clears throat> and it was, of course, implied that when you were doing this, you only present one side of the truth uh, or whatever you're trying to promote, and that you only, uh, if you do present several different uh, aspects of an issue, you make sure that your view, what you want people to adopt, is what is presented correctly, or uh, I should say, in a light that will cause people to think, oh, well, yeah, I think this is the way we should go. Uh, propaganda is a form of manipulation, but if you look up the term manipulation, it basically means leadership. And leadership goes back to, well, manipulation to get people to do what you wish. Um, that sounds very Machiavellian, but that's the way it is. I mean, if a leader gets up and says, the sun will come up tomorrow, you know, I mean, what? I mean, unless the people, uh, you, unless they're very out of touch with science, they know that the sun will come up tomorrow, and you can't say that that's leadership. If a person gets up and says, "Well, you need to eat, you need to eat tomorrow," well, that's again, that's not leadership. You know, you haven't changed anyone's opinions. If, on the other hand, you can get up and get people to act in different ways than they would have normally on their own, that's leadership. But it's also manipulation. Okay, you don't have the leader. Uh, you don't, you didn't get Obama get up and say, "Okay." Here's the reason why I – mean, here, here's uh, the new health law we want. Now, here's the bad part of it, and here's the good part of it, and we hope that you will decide to go for the good part of it, the part that I'm promoting. And you see, our politicians don't do that, okay? And our media, which we think should do that, generally doesn't anymore, or maybe they never really did, but now it's more blatant that they, that they, they show their bias. Uh, but anyway, let's go into Bernays and find out exactly uh, how he changed things. Now, Bernays originally his his major work. Now he started out, ironically enough, uh, editing medical magazines. And around 1913, um, there was a big push to try to get rid of uh, sexually transmitted disease spreads. Now, in those days, they didn't have a lot of our antibiotics that we do today. So sexually transmitted diseases such as uh, syphilis could be a death penalty for you. you could, it's like AIDS. You could catch it, and uh, if your body was weakened, you could die from it or cause insanity and all these other things. So of course, I mean that probably kept some people from going out and, uh, and spreading the disease and having sex and stuff like that. Uh, with multiple partners, but it didn't stop all. So here you got an interesting situation. You've got a desire that is hardwired into human beings, and that is to uh, reproduce. Now, how do you reproduce? You have sex. Uh, so uh, you're you're fighting something. You're trying to get people to not do something that is actually. Uh, part of the hard wire mechanism of human beings now if this you know religions you know will get up and say this is a sin you shouldn't do that and it keeps a lot of people from doing it but if you're working with public health you can't just get up and say okay god said don't do this and then that's it you can't 
you just can't do that. You've got to try to appeal to everyone. You have to try to try to appeal with them. At least up until this time period, you wanted to appeal to their rational selves. You the attitude that most people in any kind of position of influence, um, philosophy or education or something was that human beings are rational beings. We are governed by our cere you know, our cerebellum, cerebral cortex, the frontal lobes. That's what controls us. So if you give people uh, the good, the bad uh, aspects of an issue or behavior, most of them who have intelligence will choose the good. They will choose what is best for their survival and for their prosperity and for their for the benefit of their fellow man. <clears throat> okay, now that's the idea. That's the ideal that comes from the enlightenment and so forth. Now, that that of course would change, but let's get you know I'm I'm getting ahead of myself here. Now the thing is, he he was uh, he he what he did was he actually um, promoted a play on um, how to not uh, wind up a victim of syphilis. <clears throat> now, you see that's a little bit different. A play is like a story. A play is watching people and you're and you're seeing how things turn out in their lives. It's not necessarily something that you know someone gets up and starts reading facts and statistics. Um, and of course, they're not going to show you pictures of what happens when you catch this disease and things start falling off your body. But it still affects us. Now, Bernays looked at that and the fact that he was that he was able to actually persuade some people and get some behavioral change through something that was drama, that was fiction on stage. And, and he started thinking, now this this actually may be a more effective way to get people to change their habits and to think in different ways. Well, anyway, 1913, the play on syphilis. Okay, it's it's over. It's done. Something else comes up. A war breaks out in Europe. Okay, so you know that's what you get when you get a bunch of little countries where you got some king and or. Uh, all-powerful parliament or something or emperor and they have a dispute they go to war lots of poor people die rich people don't die well when the communists took over the soviet union a lot of rich people died but um the thing is that in most wars uh the poor guy goes out fights dies and you know some territory changes that's that's the history of europe up until the modern era um so anyway, uh, the United States during this time period, when um, the up-and-coming German uh, and Austro-Hungarian um, countries were starting to industrialize and really show some initiative, and were trying to get in on the on the game that the French and the English were playing and had played for centuries, where you go in and and uh, pretty much take over areas because you need their raw resources because, hey, if you're going to have a factory, you need to have things, you know, you need to have raw resources coming so you can make clothes and furniture and, and uh, th you know, machinery and stuff like that. And Europe doesn't, you know, at least Western Europe doesn't have those resources. So people had to go out, the French and English had to go out and start, you know, taking over areas or making agreements. So they could exclude other air, other colonial powers from you know getting in on the game. Well, the Germans decided they wanted to get in on the game. Uh, tensions started to rise. Well, eventually, voila, war, millions of people dying, and and so forth. Great destruction. Now, during the first few years of the war, the Americans were sitting back, going, "Sucks to be you." Towards Europe, I mean. Most Americans wanted nothing whatsoever to do with this war. In fact, some of them wanted to go in on the German side. You know why? Well, I mean, we had very emotional ties. And during this time period, there were still a lot of people, even if they were first-generation American, their parents, or maybe their grandparents, if you go a little bit further, had come from countries that basically had, well, 
just to put it bluntly, had been screwed over by the British Empire. Okay, you had the Irish, uh, a very large uh, ethnic group of, of the Caucasian or white population. Um, even today in America, Germans are Germans are the largest group, then Irish, and then people of British descent. And of course, they have to throw in the Scots and Welsh and, and the Northern Irish to get that number up. But you had a lot of people who were Irish. And when they see the Brits, you know, at war and, you know, having a bad time, the Irish are, in America are kind of going, wow, OK, well, the, you know, Germans are Germans can't be all that bad. And so you had a lot of Irish that were just kind of either saying, well, we should stay out of this war or maybe even go on the side of Germany. You had a lot of ethnic Germans uh, who were who were. Feeling the same way, you know, that, okay, well, Germany is my ancestor's homeland. So in World War I, you had this situation where um, it just what no one really wanted to go over and have a fight, okay? Uh, a very small number of business people and people who on the East Coast had this kind of uh, either ethnic or cultural connection to Britain, they wanted to to maybe get the United States involved in the war, but that wasn't going to do the trick. Now, events took place, you can read about in your history, we're not going to talk about history that much, which uh, were played up and could get people uh, actually saying, yeah, maybe we should go to war and be on Britain's side and go take out the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians at that time, the, the Turkish or Ottoman Empire. Um, so anyway, Bernays, how is he involved in all this? Well, eventually he wound up being a member of the Committee on Public Information. Now, you hear that, it sounds like, oh, we're going to give you information on all sides of the issue. No, the Committee on Public Information was basically propaganda. And what this committee would do is they would do things like um, they'd find a trusted person in the community. And we're, we're still saying that most people in those days were – they weren't connected by television and, and radio in, in those days. Uh, most people got their information from newspapers so or public meetings, town halls what they, was what they would call them. And so what you would do is you would find someone in the community, a local banker, uh, a minister, or, or someone that had some influence, and you would kind of get them in on the game and start saying, you know, maybe we need to show people that German, the Germans are the evil people in this, in this war, and maybe America needs to do something about it. And of course, again… In World War One, it's hard to say who was the bad guy, the good guy, or whatever. It was like a big family squabble. It was country versus country. Um, but the thing is, if you get up in front of a group of people and you start saying things like, uh, well, there's all these war crimes being committed by the uh, Germans. And there was things like you know, uh, things that were later found to be totally uh, lies and propaganda – that German soldiers were out raping nuns in Belgium and, and that they were bayoneting pregnant women and holding their ba the dead baby up by the bayonets and stuff like this. Total fabrications. But you know what? When you tell people this and people believe the leader, people believe this person of influence, and that person of, of influence believes the government person. Because you know that's – we talked about this earlier when we were talking about Sigmund Freud, that people want to believe what they you – know, they want to have trust. Human beings have a trust mechanism built into them. Um, you trust the leader of the tribe. You trust uh, your general in a war. And so the, the thing is you get the government… Kind of saying, well, we'd kind of like to get involved in this, but we know the people don't want to be, so we need to find ways to get them to want to be involved and to support intervention on the side of Britain. And then you find people in local communities who have the same view 
or you can persuade them to have the same view. And of course, they trust what they're hearing from the government. So then they parrot that information down to the local people and communities. And attitudes were starting to change even before – actually, even before um, the sinking of the Lusitania. But um, – Oh, we could go into the history of that all day, but then we'd skip a lot of Bernays, and I don't want to do that. Now, the thing is that to the United States government, when it actually did finally enter the war and we started sending troops, well, you want to make it sound good. So what Bernays came up with was the idea that we were uh, fighting for democracy. Or how he said it to quote make the world safe for democracy. Now people hear that here in the United States, they're going, "Wow, democracy is great!" And you know, the we want to have people having the right to vote and to speak their minds in public and and do all those kinds of things, freedom of religion. And so. Basically, this becomes something ingrained in people, even though really – what was it? A fight for democracy? The British still controlled vast uh, numbers of people around the world where they were manipulating those people and getting their resources and stuff like that. The French were doing the same thing. It wasn't like democracy was being promoted in India, for instance, but uh, this was what was being promoted, that here you got some bad guys. And here we're going to fight with the good guys. Now, when the war ended, Woodrow Wilson went over the president at the time, goes over to Europe, to France, uh, takes Bernays with him. Okay, so it shows it was not just something that eh, he's just a, he's just a PR guy like you see in um, t popular TV shows like Mad Men and stuff like that. So the thing is that. Um, Bernays sees these huge crowds in France waving U.S. and French flags together and saying and cheering uh, Woodrow Wilson like he was some sort of rock star or something as he's going in like the Beatles. <laughs> you know, he's he's up and he's like this huge hero with the masses. And Bernays then realized the power of words, the power of changing some words around. Now, you combine this with another little aspect that comes in. Like I said at the beginning, Edward Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, the man who came up with the ideas uh, that human beings are in large part, if not completely, controlled by irrational impulses that basically what a what really motivates human beings is not rationality. We're not all like Mr. Spock on Star Trek and you know, thinking, well, what's the logical way to perform this and, and so forth. It's not the way human beings work. Instead, according to Freud, we are motivated by inner subconscious desires for sex, aggression, security, and self-preservation. These are the things that motivate it. So essentially, in the Freudian model, and this is very simplistic, in the Freudian model, it's like you take uh, you can take a chimpanzee who we can recognize that the chimp would be motivated by um, sex aggression, security, and self-preservation, and suddenly we stick a human uh, brain, you know, fuse a human brain onto that chimpanzee. Well, will the chimpanzee still have those desires? Yeah, but now it'll have um, it'll have uh, more advanced cognitive thinking. Well, the thing is, what Freud is saying is that, and he was a you know he he believed in evolution. What Freud was saying was that as humans have evolved, they have developed a far more complex brain. Now, the thing is, all those other parts of the brain are still there. All those parts that uh, in the Freudian model, when you're a guy and you see a gal dressed up in a bikini at the beach, uh, subconsciously, according to the Freudian model, your, your brain is going, me want to reproduce. 
Now, the thing is, the reason why we don't have, you know, big orgies on the beach is because we have been raised and taught that that sort of thing is wrong. You don't do that, according to the Freudian model. That we 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 um, internalize the values of our family, our society, our religion, and those things will temper even those very powerful drives of sexuality or aggression. If your boss is giving you a hard time, uh, you don't usually take an axe out and decapitate them. Okay, just doesn't happen most of the time. I mean, I'm sure it does happen once in a while, and then we read about it in the newspapers. But, but for the most part, even if you might have a dream about it or a fantasy or whatever, you don't do it, and you'd feel very guilty if you did. Or if you didn't feel guilty, you might wind up in jail and and so forth. So it's just you know, 99.999% of our subconscious desires are never realized because of this. Does that mean they're still – that they're gone, that we can erase them? Absolutely not. Those subconscious desires are still there. So guy goes to the beach, sees girl in, in bikini. The desire – you can measure his brain. Those parts of the brain that are associated with sex – even if he's sitting there, he, he could be even judgmental, and this is even better. He could be sitting there going, you know, in my religion, you know, that's just not approved of. She's not being very modest. Well, you know what? Those parts of the brain still light up. In fact, they might even light up more because it's a taboo. So because you've been taught that, ah, that's bad, 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 bad. All of a sudden, now your subconscious is 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 like a is like a is like the old cartoon Tasmanian devil, you know, trying to break out of the cage and get away. So the, the thing is, the desires are still there. And Bernays, even though he was a uh, businessman, he gets a copy of his uncle's book on psychoanalysis and how the human mind works according to the Freudian model. He reads it. He doesn't sit there and go, you know, this is really neat from an intellectual standpoint. No, he doesn't read it and go, you know, we could really help people you know, knowing this stuff. No, he's a businessman. He starts going – we can actually sell stuff to people based on those desires that are – they're locked up, but they still have a huge influence on the way the person behaves. Now, he's the one who basically put the sex into advertising. He's the one that put insecurity into advertising. He's the one who really got things going. Okay? So – uh, I'll give you an example, for instance. He, 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 um, well, I'll give you several examples. Of, the first one is this. In those days when you got up for breakfast in the early part of the 20th century, when you got up uh, for breakfast, you would usually just grab a piece of bread, you know, a toasted piece of bread and a cup of coffee or if you're more health conscious, a glass of milk. And you, you, they would kill any kind of uh, stomach rumblings. And then around lunch, you would eat something with meat and more robust. And dinner, you would eat something more robust. But breakfast in those days was sort of a, okay, I'm getting up, waking up. Let's just put something in the stomach and get out there and do something. Well, here's the thing. Bernays was working for both the poultry industry and the, the pig farmers. And so – he was trying. He was he was trying to figure ways to get people to buy more um, eggs and pork. So, how does he do this? Simple. He starts a campaign to make eggs and bacon the staple or or Americana version of breakfast. And he enlists – he you know, first goes to a doctor. The doctor says, yeah, I mean it would be good if people had protein in the morning. All of a sudden, he's got an endorsement, goes to other doctors saying, well, this doctor has said this. Do you agree? And these doctors saying, yeah, yeah, you know, protein in the morning would give you more energy. And, you know, you'd, you'd probably get more done. So then he starts his ad campaign. Do uh, doctors are all saying that we need to do this and this and this. So he connects. He connects. The doctors, well, I guess in a sense it's it's true. It's more of a half truth. But you know, the doctor. I mean, if you ask a doctor, 
you know, is it going to give you more energy? Well, of course the doctor's going to say yes. So it turns from a, well, yeah, it'll give you more energy to a total endorsement. And suddenly now it's the doctors are saying that you should eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. And it starts catching on. And even though you might say, well, now, wait a minute, you know, bacon and eggs, you know, the way most Americans eat bacon and eggs nowadays, it's just like it's swimming in the grease and it's not exactly uh, very good for your heart health. But the thing is that you connected something that had that was not part of the culture to what you want people to do helps you in marketing and make it part of the culture. Uh, I could go into detail, but the same was done in in uh, the nation of Sweden, where people are. You, one of the things you notice about Sweden is you go to the door, and most people in most houses take their shoes off. It's considered improper to wear shoes in a house. And uh, if you ask the average Swede, you know about well, you know in America most people keep their shoes on unless they you know they've stepped in some you know dog mess or or uh, it's been raining outside. Um, well, the average Swede will then say, well, yeah, but it doesn't scratch the floor if you don't have shoes on or or you might be bringing bacteria in and these kinds of things. Well, that's the rational part of the brain trying to make uh, sense uh, of something that's more of an emotional thing, the way you've been brought up. And this all had actually – to do with – it wasn't Edward Bernays that did it, but others did. It had to do with uh, housing projects in Sweden that were done during the uh, 1950s and 60s and kind of an ad campaign that was to get people to um, associate comfort and coziness like taking your shoes off and just relaxing um, in these new – um, I've been to Russia. It's a Stalinistic apartment houses that were going up all over uh, urban areas. And the the thing is that, again, if you ask an average Swedish person, well, where does this come from? They're like, uh, I don't know. I, it's just the way it's always been in our culture. No, it's not. It has not been that way. No more than bacon and eggs were part of a, the culture of America um, during the uh, you know. Well, 1900 and before. And another thing that Bernays was able to do was uh, connect cigarettes and freedom with women because he was working for the tobacco companies. And the tobacco companies were saying that in America in um, – just after the war, yeah, men were starting to take up smoking because it was getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to do so. Because you, in the old days, you had to roll cigarettes by hand, and if, it, if they came in a little box, they were rolled by hand. They were kind of expensive because you had to pay lots of people to stand there and roll the cigarette. You know, to put the tobacco in the paper, or roll it up, and you know, put it in the box. Well, with mechanization that was taking place during this time period, all of a sudden now you can make millions and millions and millions of cigarettes in a day in your company. And cheaper because you know you don't have to pay people to, to roll them. And well, it's not going to do you any good if there's crates of cigarettes sitting in your warehouse. You got to sell them. So they were thinking, well, where's a new market for selling these cigarettes? Women. Women weren't smoking. It was considered improper. Uh, it was considered like you know, um, a woman you know chewing tobacco or putting you know tobacco under their lip or something like that. In America today, still that is. Looked upon like you know, you, you, my, my image is an overweight woman wearing a, uh, a a dress with flowers on it, and you know someone living in a trailer with a couple of teeth missing. That's an image. Um, and in those days, the image of a woman smoking, in, especially in public, was that is just not heard of. That's wrong. You just don't do that. So Bernays had to figure out what to do. Now, according to what I've found, the uh, he goes to a uh, psychiatrist who's trained in you know his uncle's uh, views on sexuality and stuff. And according to the psychiatrist, uh, the cigarettes represented the male organ. Now, of course, the uh, male organ also represents power. If you look up you know Jungian psychology on archetypes and stuff like that. 
even, in fact, even today when we say, well, um, let's say I you know, hear people in America talking about Bonnier, the um, Congress, the leader of the Republicans in Congress saying, well, Bonnier doesn't have any balls. I mean, that's something you hear, you know, because he doesn't, you know, they, they're they mad because he doesn't stand up to Obama and that sort of thing. And, that, you know, the point I just want to make is we still use sexual metaphor when you have a situation where a man may be weak and not uh, presenting himself. You know, you, you use that, you know, use a term like, oh, he doesn't have any balls or he needs, you know, well, I won't go into detail about this. Lots of slang terms, but they are part of our psyche. And Freud said that the cigarette represented a, um, as do all phallic symbols, a uh, vicarious penis or power. Uh, so, so then Bernays comes up with a really great idea. He has these women go into a parade, and he's already told the media, hey, there's something really you know, strange is going to happen here, something really spectacular these women are going to do. And the media all thought, well, it must be like a suffragettes or women wanting to vote, and so it's scandal. So they sent all the reporters there because this is before women had the right to vote in the United States except in the states of, I think, Utah and Wyoming allowed women to vote. But <laughs> the other states didn't. Um, so the the thing was that the the reporters are showing up because this is this is like one of those you know how the reporters show up if you say that FEMA the the group in from Ukraine is going to show up and protest. Well, the reporters are going, oh wow, these women are all got you know run around topless and scream whatever political views they have, and you know that brings in the media. So media is no different in those days, but these women kept their tops on. But what they did was they whipped out cigarettes and started smoking them during this parade. Well, this was a scandal. It showed up on front pages of newspapers around the United States. But Bernays made sure to tell the newspaper reporters that this particular event was called the Torches of Freedom. And so he associated not just the sexuality that this psychiatrist told him that cigarettes could be made to represent for women and, and the metaphor for power and independence, but also the words of torches of freedom, which, of course, Americans are like, yes, we believe in freedom and we fight for democracy and all these things. Well, that's all it took. And women started smoking, and sales for cigarettes went way up. And they didn't just stop there either because then the tobacco companies were told, have leading starlets with pictures taken smoking because people follow what other people are doing. Again, what I said about the trusted leaders. It's not just the political leaders, the tribal leaders. It's the people around you. You do what they're doing. I mean this is true for eras. I mean – uh, during the French Revolution, they would they would arrest thousands and thousands and thousands of people on any suspicion whatsoever that they had something to do with um, the aristocracy that they had just overthrown in France. And many, many, many of these people were later just released. You know, they didn't have enough evidence or whatever. But a lot of these upper class or middle class women were hearing stories that when they would put the put women. Uh, in the guillotine and pull the lever and the guillotine blade would come down that it would only cut a little bit of the neck because of all the hair because the style in those days was to have long flowing hair and uh, they heard these horror stories whether true or not that sometimes the, the, the woman who was getting her head chopped off would only get part of her neck severed and she'd still be alive and suffering before they could yank the blade out of her neck and then bring it up again and then bring it down again to finally do her in and remove the head. So what these upper class French women started doing was they started cutting their hair short in the prisons. Now when they got released, when all these uh, women who were still influential, I mean people were going, oh, what are the, what are the uh, elite people doing? Even though there was a revolution against elitism, it's still part of human nature. What are the, what are the beautiful people doing? Well, all of a sudden, you see all the beautiful women or the upper class women with short hair, many times above their ears. And all of a sudden, short hair came into style, and that style lasted for nearly a century for women in Europe. 
where you would cut your hair uh, short, not the long, natural, flowing hair uh, or the you know long hair that was bundled up, because women had had started cutting their hair in prisons because they were afraid that if they were slated to be killed by the uh, by the revolutionaries, that it would be a very painful death. So it's better to get it over with fast. And so you see these kinds of things, they, they, they come in. We look at trends. We look at what people are doing, and we start thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe I should dress this way or do this way. Well, nowadays, that's in, that's in media and what we see visually. And in his day, films were starting to become popular. You, you know, they were silent at first, but you would see people, you know, see the leading starlet sitting there with the, you know, the long stick thing. I don't know what they call it. And then. An extension? Hmm, that's very Freudian, you know. Make it longer. Well, anyway, they'd put the cigarette into this extension and and smoke it, and they'd have this very elegant pose about them. And women would see this when they go to the theater, young women especially, and think, "I want to be like that." And so they would buy these extensions and put the cigarette in, and and this made them feel like even if they were really dirt poor, that they were being like the leading starlet to the movie. And this is where product placement came in. It doesn't make any sense. I mean it's like a monkey see, monkey do. But the thing is that's the way human, the human mind seems to work. So anyway, Bernays uh, goes on and starts becoming more and more and more and more influential. And other people start taking his views and start using them. And uh, basically making a lot of money selling things to people. And this really helped because this was, again, this is where America's industry really, really picked up. So they had all these products that were being produced at incredible rates and going cheaper and cheaper because the faster you produce them and the more competition you have, the cheaper they get because people innovate and so forth. And, and so you had to get rid of them. You had to get, get these things out of the warehouse, and once you got those out of the warehouse, you got more of them being made. And you had to, So this is where planned obsolescence came in. It used to be that people wore their clothes until they fell off them, and then you bought some new ones. Well, this is where when, for instance, women's shoes – let's choose women's shoes here. Um, there are so many women that have a closet full of shoes that you know, and, and very expensive shoes, but they don't wear – most of them anymore, and you'd say, well why, well, why don't you wear those shoes? Well, they're out of style. Now, is it true too for a lot of guys, you know, especially in America, in inner city uh, high schools, where uh, instead of having lots of shoes and designer shoes, the designer shoe is more of the designer athletic shoe. There's been people, you know, killed over their brand new um, designer shoe you know they don't go running in it or anything but it's still a five or six hundred dollar pair of sneakers well it because it's taking on a different meaning and so bernays is the one that started the whole concept that you are what you wear what you own what you earn okay and when you buy these products it reflects who you are, and so you're showing the rest of the world who you are, and it makes you feel better because now it satisfies you at a subconscious level, whether, again, self-preservation, sexuality, stuff like this. If a man wants to buy a car and he's feeling a little inadequate, you know, I mean, they're just talking about the Freudian notion. The guy feels small, and well, I won't go into detail what that means. He buys a big car, big muscle car, or maybe he takes up weightlifting or, or, or those kinds of things to compensate. Well, this is what advertising hits on. It hits on fear. Oh, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to, you got to wear this, you got to use this soap, this antiperspirant, you got to spray this on your hair, you got to put this gel on on your hair so it'll stay younger. Hair, sorry, hair is dead. It's dead waste material. It looks nice. It provides a lot of functions. But if you put something on your hair to bring it back to life, I mean, I'm sure you've heard those advertisements many times. Bring your hair back to life. Well, the only living part is the part you don't see in the follicle underneath the skin. The rest of it, it's waste. But, you know, I mean, 
people believe it. Like, oh, yeah, that helps you know bring my hair to life. Your hair is not alive, fortunately. Otherwise, when you cut it, it would hurt. Okay, so you know this is part of the human irrationality, and Bernays got right in there. Now, what I would like to do is basically I want to quote Bernays and describe exactly how this is extremely influential in today's society on another level, and not just how you sell things, but um, the idea of control of people in reference to what they do besides just buying products. Now, Freud felt that human beings were irrational. And, you know, I mean, this is and when they get together they do nasty things. A human individual will often control themselves. Get a bunch of them together and they do nasty things like riot and do mob attacks and stuff. And there's some of the stuff we see coming out of Egypt right now. I mean, if you look at videos, if you see some of the stuff in Syria, you see people doing things that maybe in their normal life, they were just normal everyday students or shop owners or whatever. And here you see them, you know, holding people down and actually cutting their heads off or, or doing all kinds of nasty, horrible, atrocious things. Well, Freud said that's because when the groups get together, suddenly they see other people doing bad things and they get permission to do those bad things. And so you have what even our founding fathers in America called mob mentality. And you know, that's why they built the system of checks and balances. So mob mentality, you know, where you just say, well, 51% of the people say, let's go take this person, the other 49%'s property, then you know, that's democracy. Well, they they were the uh, founding fathers did not like that because they, they felt that when groups get together, they do bad things. And they had, you know, look at the Roman Empire, you know, lots of in instances of that. But it doesn't take much of looking to, to find these kinds of uh, Hobbesian nightmares. But the thing is that Freud said that human beings are just a, very, a small step from doing all those nasty things that are hidden in the subconscious, that people will do things that are really nasty. So you have to control that. And so Bernays actually felt that democracy needed to have kind of an elite control where people could channel those forces. If people were buying products, if they were uh, feeling satisfied because they just bought a new car or, or they have all the nice designer clothes or they have a nice house, then they'll let the governing of society be left to the people who know what's best. And of course, that's very elitist uh, and so forth, but that is how Bernays felt. He was not an authoritarian, although these kinds of ideas could be used by an authoritarian. He – how do you say this though? He, he wanted to control the people, but he wanted to do it in a soft way, redirect their energies. So if you think of this kind of metaphor, you think of Bernays out there and there's thousands of people you know, in a, in a riot – you know, the lights go out in New York or something. People are burning and, and stuff. You can just think of Bernays coming up to the, this mob and saying, wouldn't you rather go out and go, you know, the, go down to the mall down there and uh, buy some stuff? Because that will make you feel better as human beings. Well, that's very simplistic, but essentially that's what Bernays is saying. Make it a consumer culture where people are out buying stuff. They're listening to what they're told in the media. Uh, by trusted newscasters who are well, – of course, the newscasters getting their information from whoever's writing the script. The person writing the script is getting what they're, they need to write into there from their boss, the editor, whatever. The editor knows he has to keep the owners of the corporation that publishes the newspaper or the television or whatever happy. So this all works to filter a message to the masses. Let me read you that one quote from uh, the very famous book Propaganda. If you haven't seen Propaganda or read it, it's on the internet. You can get free, you know read it for free. It's even though a lot of the organizations that he mentions no longer have any real influence in America. He 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 actually states, for instance, the Ku Klux Klan. At, he points that to them as a major political uh, movement. Well, in his day, they were. 
there were millions of members of the Ku Klux Klan. But nowadays it's what? It's just some fanatics and probably most of them are actually, you know, government informants and stuff like that. I mean, it's no longer an organization that really carries any influence in the political uh, lives of Americans. But everything what, what he says though in concept remains true. And uh, the irony is even the Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist, he read up on Bernays, which is kind of ironic because Bernays, he's Jewish. And he used Bernays' works in order to whip up the masses and use that in his model to take over Germany and then to use the model to get Germans to do as the German government wanted them to do. So it's one of those really weird ironies of history. But it is the – you know, it works. The, the, these ideas work. But anyway, um, on to Bernays' works. The, uh, he states here. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in dem democratic society. Notice, manipulation of people's views, feelings, attitudes. That's important to do in democracy. Now, does, that sounds kind of like, what? That's the opposite of democracy. No, but he's saying it's necessary in democracy. Of course, he's assuming that there's an elite that is better educated, better informed, and better suited to uh, cause people to do what is best in their interest. Those who manipulate the unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. Now, it sounds conspiratorial, but what he's saying is that there's policies that come up, okay, and they range, in, you know, in all kinds of things. Whether it be, well, you know, we can't sell people on going to war with Iran's right now, but maybe if we start doing this and leaking certain news to news organizations and make Iran look really bad and horrible and like the uh, incarnation of evil. And so forth. Then you could do a repeat of like, oh, the Germans, you know, are bayonetting those pregnant women in Belgium. You know, I mean, you could do the same thing. It, it, things, do, history does not change. The mechanisms of getting information out to the public has really become. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal compared to 1917. But the, the basic psychology of Bernays is still the same. So anyway, um, he feels that. You know, there's people on the top, and let me explain this in some detail here. People at the top come up with a policy. They filter that to opinion makers around the country. Now, this works. It's not just the United States. This is worldwide. Every country has this, okay? Uh, every single country on earth. Those in a leadership position, however they got that leadership position, they want a policy. So they start filtering information down to the influential people. They, maybe those are universities, maybe those uh, media, even uh, celebrities, and you give a certain message to those people. Those people then transfer or filter that message down to the masses. I'm skipping some mechanisms here, but essentially it goes out to the masses. And it, and, you, and you don't do it fast. You do it slow. You know the old, the whole boiling frog thing. You know where you stick a frog in cold water and then you turn the heat on, and the frog uh, adapts to the heat going up more and more and more until it, it, it reaches a level where it dies because the water's too hot. Versus if you put a frog in hot water, it'll hop out of there real fast. Well, that's the same way here. I mean, persuasion is best when it's done subtly and it's over time. Okay, so so it be, and then when the masses adopt these values that you have pushed, or ideas, or opinions, or whatever, they start encouraging each other. According to that, it becomes the new social norm. You see it on TV. You see it. You know. You see other people do it. You're taught that in school. You. Um, Laws start to reflect this, and then there's a feedback loop. It starts going back up again. So the masses adopt an attitude, 
they start electing people to, let's say, state or municipal uh, offices who have that same attitude. Uh, it becomes not a new attitude, but it becomes the norm for what has to be taught in schools and what has to be presented in respectable media and so forth. And so it goes up. And then it starts influencing the elite to a certain degree that may have come up with the idea in the first place because now they're saying, oh, well, this is what we have to present to people. So maybe the large film studios will start showing these new ideas in their movies because now this is what the people are saying they want. And so that goes down and further reinforces the ideas that originally maybe 20 or 30 years previously had been ideas that were meant to be filtered down to the public. Um, you know, I mean, the sexual revolution did not start just because of Wilhelm Reich promoting it. And all of a sudden, you know, he goes on and starts, you know, going, giving speeches. Wilhelm Reich did not do that. But what happened was academics and various other influential people uh, latched onto his ideas and started filtering them down to the masses. And, you know, those started in like the 1940s and 50s. And then it accumulated in this huge huge change in people's attitudes towards sex and sexuality and so forth in the 1970s and nowadays we have people look at russia with their with their laws on um you know they passed some law that said you can't quote promote homosexuality amongst people under the age of 18 well people in the western world are going wow the russians are really backward i mean we're, but the russians did not go through the sexual revolution you have to understand that. So they're looking at it like, well, this is what we've always felt and believed and part of our culture and all this kind of stuff. The people in the West are going, well, you guys are just being horrible and, and mistreating people and not having their civil rights. Well, the thing is, again, two different cultures. One culture had certain things happen and another one didn't. So therefore, you know, there's this like, well, you know, both cultures look at each other like, well, you guys just don't understand. It's not saying right or wrong. It's just saying that's the way it is. Um, and the the Edward Bernays said that could that influences everything from the way that we raise families, get married, to uh, such things as you know the soap we buy. Look up the history of diamond rings. Come on, I mean it's not been forever. All right. If you look at the Bible, what did they use to get married? The woman, when she got married, she put a nose ring into her nose. That's right, all you goths out there. You know, you are you, you represent more of those traditional values in the Bible when it comes to your piercings than do people today that look and go, oh, no, my daughter's getting a nose piercing. It's so horrible, you know, and what will people think at church? You know, pastor so-and-so is going to be thinking we're just a horrible family. Well, okay, this is um, – the whole diamond ring thing, the ring on the finger, it has a history. And you'll be surprised if you look it up. It's very similar to the whole eggs and bacon thing. Well, anyway, he goes on. We are governed. Our minds are molded. Our tastes formed. Our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is the logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast major vast member ugh, Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. No, this is not some sort of conspiracy guy. He's saying this is good this is the way it should be and i think i've explained to you then um hopefully and i just i don't want people to take my word for it okay look it up for yourselves this is very interesting psychology and you'll get addicted to it you'll start going wow i didn't realize this and this and this and you know not just di you know diamond rings come from where i mean what bags and eggs and all this kind of stuff it's really fascinating and it'll open your eyes up to how things are happening in the world today and how it'll explain so much to you. Anyway, we're, we've run out of time here. Sorry, I uh, go on for this for hours. But anyway, uh, thank you for listening and hope to hear back from you next week when we have another episode of Unlock the Door Radio.